Cruz Pepinas, a Director of Federal Policy and a wonderful colleague. She is going to be speaking with Taylor Kirkendall. And Taylor is a reporter with S&P Global Market Intelligence, and the two of them are going to be talking about coal. So where's coal going? And what I will say is they're coming up. Come on up. Um, if you know, you're going to enjoy the conversation today, if you want a second pass at it, I'm going to plug another podcast called The Energy Transition Show. Because you can listen, and we have a host of The Energy Transition Show here as well, a guy named Chris Nelder, who was on the Utility Scale Breakout Session. Chris, so right there, yeah. You can hear Chris interviewing Taylor, talking about coal, again, if you want a second pass at it. And in fact, uh, we have another, someone else from the Energy Transition Show that Chris interviewed, Eric Gimont, uh, talking about uh, grids, uh, grid integration. Both of them are going to be on the utility scale uh, renewables panel at the breakout sessions. So that's a little preview. But let's pass it over to Aaron and to Taylor and talk to us about coal. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, for those of you looking to take over the social media scene, let's call it Brangelina instead of Brad and Angelina. I think if we want to be relevant on social media, we have to use the millennial terms. <laughs> All right. So um, this afternoon, we are going to go through a quick discussion on international trends as it relates to coal-fired power. Um, just post lunch, I'll bring it back to a little bit of the context of why we think this is an interesting uh, topic for us to be discussing here at the summit today. And you know, as other participants in, in the forum today have said, it's really all about the Paris Agreement, and that's really the driving force behind why we want to examine uh, decarbonization trends in the electricity sector, both at home and abroad today. So as other folks have said today, the Paris Agreement limit, uh, aims to limit uh, global temperature increase to well below 2 degrees Celsius and encourages all countries to pursue efforts to limit that temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. And through its recognition of the common but differentiated responsibility principle, the Paris Agreement also acknowledges historical differences in contributions to global environmental problems. And therefore, current day realities for developed countries like ours to scale ambitious and transformative climate policies across their economies. But when you strip away the UN speak, what the Paris Agreement really calls for is total cuts to carbon pollution in the next 35 years. And for Canada, what this means is transition away from polluting sources of energy like oil, gas, and coal, and towards low carbon solutions for transportation, the built environment, and industrial processes. So of course there's still many details to be worked out around just how we'll go about doing that, but one thing is for sure, the conversation is not if the world will transition away from fossil fuels, rather it's how and how quickly. And so for Canada, this conversation comes at a time when the machinery of our national and subnational governments are speaking to each other once again, and perhaps unlike before, working together to build a coherent policy framework for Canada to ensure that we, at a minimum, meet that 2030 international climate obligation. So governments, including Indigenous governments and civil society organizations, and of course the private sector, are fervently focused on domestic climate policy, and more specifically how to translate those big, lofty international uh, ambitions into policy action here at home. So we think part of what uh, that will entail for Canada is an accelerated phase out coal-fired power. So that brings us to our session here this afternoon. Many experts, including I think many of, of those who are in the room today, have concluded that in order to decarbonize the economy, we need to promote fuel switching and to use more clean electricity to power our daily activities and our lives. But what does that mean for electricity supply in North America, and more broadly, what does that mean for the world? And so on that score, we're lucky to have Taylor with us here today to work through some of those big questions. So Taylor Kirkendall is a coal reporter with S&P Global Market Intelligence. Taylor spends his nine to five, or maybe nine to six, or nine to seven, 
uh, reporting on issues affecting the U.S. coal industry, including government policies, financial markets, land use development strategies, and many other issues. And he joins us today from Charlottesville, Virginia. Hey, Taylor. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being here. Very exciting. So to kick our fireside chat off, um, so of course I can't help but notice you're a West Virginian. And so coal culture must be in your blood. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about um, the context in the U.S. as it relates to coal-fired power. How would you characterize this current state of coal-fired power? And in particular, what trends have you observed in the last decade? Right, I mean, simply put, um, being in the coal industry right now is, is uh, frankly terrible if you're uh, you know, trying to make any money, especially in the U.S. Um, one thing I want to start with um, that's kind of a lot of really underreported and not mentioned a lot um, to explain this is um, kind of how we got here, and that's um, when you hear a lot of news about the coal industry right now, of course, uh, coal power generation is declining very significantly. But um, you're also hearing a lot of financial stress in these companies. Um, a lot of that has nothing to do with what's going on with regulation or what's um, what we're trying to do to, to address climate change. Um, a lot of their problems is late 2011, they basically made multi-billion dollar debts, or sorry, bets on the metallurgical coal market. They thought China was going to um, continue to produce steel and forever. Um, those bets turned out to be wildly off. and. They were unable to service their debt. Um, that said, um, there's a lot of factors, and we're going to get into those a little bit later, about why um, coal is kind of um, in the situation it is now. And, um, and I think, in the same way that there's no really like kind of um, silver bullet to, to explain why coal went down, there's also none to explain you know, how we're going to, you would be able to revive it in any way. But the, the main problem for coal right now and coal generation, the, the future is highly uncertain. Um, much of the industry is bankrupt, and the public opinion is largely against coal. Uh, the problem with all three of those factors is um, whenever somebody has a chance to build a, um, a new source for power, and the supplies everywhere, particularly in the U.S. right now, um, no one's building a new coal. Um, we're talking about you know finding new sources of electricity. We're also um, talking about just shuttering the plants that they have now. So you can't get people that um, you know on Wall Street or anywhere else to kind of sink this capital investment. In. And just to kind of go really quickly, I think some of these things show a little bit uh, the scale of the problem. Um, this is the, the, the market values of some of the publicly traded coal companies in the United States um, since I believe like 2011. Uh, you, obviously, it's clear you didn't want to be an investor in coal, um, didn't pay off the market, punched them pretty harshly. The only thing you see there that has any kind of anomaly is the little blue line, this is salt energy, um, and they're switching to natural gas, so that's how they survived. But um, just a couple of things, so this is an example of how, how large the scale is. In, in, in the United States, about 45.6% or or of the coal that, that is um, going to the coal-fired electricity sector uh, came from a coal company that's been in bankruptcy, is in bankruptcy or filed since 2012. Um, so nearly half of the coal that we are burning, even though it's only now about a third of the power that we, uh, we produce, is coming from companies that are bankrupt. This is one mine um, there in the center in Wyoming. You can see that's uh, Arch Coal. Um, that mine is, you know, was largely economical. You can just kind of want to show you how, how widespread you know one coal mine can go. Another one you can look at when we uh, look out in the future, 2025. Only about six states are going to be dominating by coal. Um, that's these are based on our projections. Um, also, coal retirements. Um, every single dot there is a coal plant that someone plans to close in the, between 2012 and 2021. Some are gone. Um, some will be gone soon. Um, and then also just wanted to kind of make sure this is an issue we touch on. And some people are sensitive about that um, access not starting at zero, so I like to point it out so that nobody thinks we're trying to manipulate anything, just like to see the trend. But um, coal jobs have been just absolutely decimated as a result, um, and I think that's something that we kind of miss sometimes, that that should be a part of the conversation. Those There's whole regions where people you know, don't have a job anymore. But um, that said, like, what's even kind of like making this even worse, this is um, the Department of Energy's in the U.S. coal tech funding versus for carbon capture, things like that, versus what they're putting in renewables. Um, I think all the things I mentioned before, plus this, is a really, really strong symbol for a signal from the market that um, you know coal generation is not going to be going up anytime soon in the United States. Great. So you've, you've uh, walked us through a couple of really interesting graphics there. I wonder if you might be able to give us some insight around what's driving these trends. So is it primarily commodity prices, is it economics, policies, you know, talked about the Paris Agreement. Uh, what, what's driving this, or is this a multitude of factors? Well, the fun thing about writing about coal all the time is I get to mention all of these in every story at the bottom. So, uh, natural gas prices, that's the main driver. And I, I don't think that we really have to um, emphasize that because all the other factors, regulations, um, protests that have been able to shut either, I don't have to say protests to any things that have happened in the 
legal level um, in corporates or anywhere else. All of those are kind of enabled by the fact that because natural gas prices are so low in the United States, you can kick coal out and not have to worry about the cost of electricity being affected that much. Um, that was the problem with the coal forever. It told everybody that you know if you stop burning coal, if we um, don't build new coal power plants, your electricity prices are going to skyrocket. And in most places in the U.S., I don't think that's been the case, and that's largely because um, we found a way to unlock cheap shale gas. Um, so that's a real, a real big driver. But also. Um, as that's kind of played out, um, the United States has started putting in rules that are going to make it even harder for coal to ever compete. So now as we're starting to finally see natural gas prices rise after a really long low point, um, <laughs> the coal companies aren't competing because they now have some regulations to deal with. Utilities are kind of looking at that cost and thinking, you know, I'm not too concerned about maybe a little extra cost when I, you know, the next president might come in and make an even stricter climate regulation. So, um, all these things are planning to them to it. And then you've got public sentiment that's largely against coal. So, you know, it's hard to find much support unless you're in one of the regions that mine coal and can directly economically benefit from that. Great. Right. I think by telling us that you think the next president might bring in stricter environmental policies, you may have just told us how you're going to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, no, no. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a, a bit of insight into the current trends. What about the medium term? I mean, if you're seeing fluctuations in gas prices, uh, what does the, the medium term future look like for U.S. coal? Right, and the past like two, three years, probably the saddest place you could be was a coal industry conference. Um, they, <laughs> I have to go to a lot of them. Um, but they, um, the, we're actually starting to see some optimism now. Um, it's kind of weird, and, um, and it's, I think they're, they're somewhat realistic about it. Um, natural gas prices are starting to come up, and um, in particular in the U.S., we had a very, very mild winter. Um, and then I'm pretty, like, um, before that we had a summer that wasn't too bad either. But basically, we weren't using power. And what happened is now our coal stockpiles built up. Uh, nobody was burning it, so now all of a sudden nobody wants to pay anything for coal. Prices were really depressed. Uh, the past, like I said, quarter, two quarters, we've seen a rise uh, a little bit. And I think a lot of people are predicting, and it's, it's hard to project these sort of things, but a lot of people are thinking back into the back half of 2017, there might even be a bump in coal production and coal consumption in the United States. It's not a lot. It's not going to go back to where it was. But um, there's, I think there are seeing some opportunities, and that's mostly weather-driven, not really a change in, in you know, um, the utility's desire to burn more coal or you know, regulations being loosened up. Um, it's really just a factor of where we need more power and coal comes up a little bit, but largely natural gas is the place a lot of those places. Great. And, hey, oh, I did actually have um, a, a medium term forecast. You can see that this is most of the coal, and, um, and then largely flattens off through 2017. But um, for um, more like long term and medium term, as you can see here, that's largely a, a function of the clean power plan. Uh, the first bar here is uh, 2015, and then we have the reference case and a no clean power plan case. Um, as you can tell, um, as we start to move down that line, the clean power plan really drives coal even further. So, out to 2040, coal is still burned. Um, and again, it's not factor in any kind of disruptions in the market or things that we don't know about. But with the clean power plan, we're probably going to be burning a lot less coal pretty soon. All right, so um, shifting gear just a little bit. So we've heard from a, a number of different experts and speakers here today. Uh, a theme that's come up a few times is that you know, climate policy can be politically fraught in Canada. And as a result, sometimes mitigation policies like accelerated coal phase-outs are characterized as drastic or scary, despite, in some cases, good evidence to the contrary. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the coal landscape more globally in order to situate the policy discussion here at home. You know, are Canada and the U.S. alone in this? Uh, what trends are you observing in, in other OECD countries? Right, so um, and then there's, I think when you look globally, um, some of the main players in this, uh, Denmark, France, UK, they're all doing, working on the coal phase out. Um, the only country that we believe, um, according to the IEA, that's, that have We've done the opposite of that is you have, I think, Russia, and um, I believe we also have, uh, sorry, one other country, but Russia and uh, Australia, sorry, um, and a lot of that's exports. Um, but then the, uh, the non OECD countries is really kind of where the, the challenge is. Places like China and India is a, is a huge um, electrification problem, and I think that's where we're going to start seeing kind of the, the, the future. Well, if you look into uh, kind of the future, when you look out, um, coal's largely leveled off. Um, a lot of people, you can look at this graph looking at the future for the EIA, and it looks like, you know, it doesn't look so great because we're still seeing um, coal UC rise and not the OECD and also OECD countries. But I think what's important to look at this graph is the, the very sharp uh, deceleration in coal growth, um, which is kind of the trend that's more important. And this again, um, the EIA is kind of unfortunately bad at predicting anything that could happen other than the clean power plan, what we know now. 
Um, technology innovation happens all the time. This is kind of the ceiling for gold. This is not its, it's you know, almost not its best case. This is, or sorry, this is its best case. This is not like the worst case scenario for gold. So I think when they look at this, it's really hard to kind of justify new um, investments, really, in any country, uh, especially OECD countries. Almost all of them went off coal. Um, I believe it's been falling in OECD countries since 2007. Um, really, no signs of that reversing anytime soon. And so when we think about policy commitments here in Alberta and perhaps a, a national commitment around an accelerated coal phase out, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, examples where this has happened successfully in the past and maybe where we can look to for guidance. Right, and uh, you actually can not look to the United States for that. We don't have any state that has successfully really weaned itself off of coal um, when it had a large um, coal generation presence to begin with. Um, Washington's getting close to that. and. Um, we, uh, Ontario is kind of the example we looked to in this graphic that we have, this from a series that we did um, called The Future of Coal. Um, one of the things that we were trying to figure out um, when we did this was, um, we hear that you can't run a grid without coal. Um, Ontario was the example that we looked to. And you can see how quickly, I mean, that's that's a very impressive phase out of coal. Um, but of course, it had its own problems. Um, there, were, there were infrastructure challenges, and this isn't the market I cover um, typically, but there were definitely challenges with, it, with raising electricity costs. Um, and I think that it's important that that is an example, not a, um, a package. You don't buy Ontario's um, path with, to, to go in coal free. Um, you use it as a, as a way to learn. And particularly what comes out to mind is um, in the US, nuclear really struggles to, to get a permit on people are, are across the scared of nuclear, but also it's expensive. Um, and then also um, a lot of that was enabled by hydropower being available. There's a lot of states like West Virginia where more than 95% of the power comes from coal generation. Um, they're not going to be able to switch to hydropower. So everybody's path to getting off of coal, if that's where we're heading, um, is, is going to have to look drastically different. But I think when you start seeing um, Alberta move towards those things and Ontario do those things, everybody's going to learn from each other. And the first movers might end up like you know, hitting a few rough patches along the way. But um, I mean, if, if that's the path forward, somebody's going to start it. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to pick up on just something that you said um, in your earlier remarks around uh, non OECD countries like India and China. So how can we reconcile claims like the ones that I made opening this uh, session around you know, fossil fuels are being shown the door? How do we reconcile that when new plants are being built in parts of the world? Right, I mean, the easy answer to that is it's not a straight line down, right? We're not, we're not gonna go from 100 to zero on coal plants. Um, when coal plants make sense economically, and they will um, in the future, there'll be places where that makes sense um, in pockets around the globe. I think we're gonna see them. And so like, just because there's a few new plants coming up here and there, um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to see you know, some of the disruption. And then you also get into the, uh, there's another kind of line of conversation. Are we, do you try to phase out coal, or do you want to maybe focus on phasing out carbon dioxide emissions? Um, in places like you know the U.S. and Canada, that probably does mean phasing out coal. Um, in places like China and India, maybe it makes sense to develop carbon capture technology. And do we want to leave those countries up to themselves to do that, or do we want to try to develop it here? The United States is only a little bit, um, so is Canada. Um, none of those have been very successful. They've been very expensive. But um, I think there's probably a real chance of being able to kind of talk about those sort of things. Mm, great. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly CCS comes up a lot in policy discussions in Canada. Uh, we'll see how that factors into our potential pan-Canadian plan announcement at the end of the year. So let's turn our discussion now to other policy outcomes that intersect with coal, so not specifically climate. In Canada, we see much of the discussion around an accelerated phase-out, uh, focusing on the well-documented climate consequences, but also the health impacts of these facilities. And certainly, there were thematic elements of that in both the commitments that were made in Ontario and also here in Alberta. Uh, but I wonder, you know, perhaps we're getting to this through the question of CCS as well. Can technology save the coal market? Is this something that can we mitigate these uh, these impacts to to the climate and to to air quality through a technology fix? Is that possible? And what would it take, in your view, to keep coal online? Right, and I think we have seen this a little bit before. Um, you know, several decades ago, um, coal plants were a lot dirtier than they are now. Um, we had sulfur, you know, alpha dioxide, all kinds of other things that we were trying to treat mercury emissions, and the U.S. is just getting to treating that right now. Um, CCS is a completely different kind of thing. We don't really have the solution for that yet. So, like, um, I think that that technology is something that's probably going to need massive you know, subsidy to just survive. And it kind of comes down to a philosophical question of whether you want to do that or not. But I think even the um, some of the large coal miners are starting to say like, we need we need policy parity. It's so kind of the buzzword um, that that matches what you know solar and wind have. Um, if they're going to develop carbon capture, because at this point. 
again, it's cheaper to build a natural gas plant to comply with the Clean Power Plan. So if we're going to develop CCS and decide that CCS is something important to do, then it's going to take some sort of outside investment that's outside of what we currently have right now. We need more research, uh, more development, and everything like that. And again, maybe that doesn't make sense for these countries like the U.S. and Canada, but I, I, I do think it's going to be really hard to have a conversation about electrifying China and India without including CCS in some way. But also we have incentives to develop it because once you have the basics of CCS figured out, then you can begin to look at how you can put those on industrial plants and things like that and, and other maybe non-power um, ways of reducing our emissions. Great. It's an interesting insight and I think it is particularly interesting in the context of the falling cost of alternatives, right? And so how do you balance the role of government in either subsidizing technology choices or um, other types of new generation? I uh, wanted to pick up again on the theme that we heard this morning around uh, investor confidence. So the, the data that you presented in your early slides obviously tells a story that uh, has pretty significant economic pain associated with it. So how should we interpret investor confidence in the coal sector when the industry is very clearly in flux and there are sort of multi-variable uh, factors at play here? Right. I think if we did a survey and had everybody raise their hand, I don't think anybody's going to say they would invest in a coal plant in this room. And I don't think you would um, see any hands go up in a room full of bankers either. Um, coal investors, equity investors, for example, um, they're not putting any money into coal. They're not um, buying into coal stock. A great example of this, there's two or three coal companies. Um, you can look at their balance sheets right now. They, they look fine. Um, they have plants that are largely captive to power plants that are going to survive the clean power plant. Um, but their stocks dwindle on this because um, nobody has any confidence. And they can demonstrate on paper that they're a viable company. But um, the market just doesn't want to invest in them. And then now the other problem, the one that's really challenging everybody right now, is that because of all this debt that they took on, the bankruptcies that they did, they, they're going to banks that these have relationships with, and nobody wants to lend them any money. I mean, they, the, the, the market for investing in coal right now is just um, completely shot in the US. I just want to let the room know that we will have time for questions. So Taylor and I are just going to go through one uh, additional question that I think is really interesting. And then uh, we will open it up to the floor. So if you've got a, a burning question, just keep it in your back pocket and we will come to you shortly. So I want to pick up on the June 2016 uh, North American Leader Summit. It's been referenced um, already as it relates to oil and gas methane. I wonder uh, if you can talk a little bit about the aggregate clean energy target that was established for North America. So they, the three leaders committed to achieve 50% clean power generation uh, by 2025. So what does this mean for coal on both sides of the border? And what are the opportunities for Canada and the US to tackle coal phase out of both jurisdictions uh, together? I think that's where a lot of coal companies kind of throw things like this on the pile of things that say they're not going to have anybody invest in them anymore. But um, this is, um, again, it's a really strong commitment um, and a very powerful message to come from world leaders to say that we're going to take this like you know global initiative on to, to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide. And that's, right now, that's a, a very good time for coal. I think um, it's hard to say exactly specifically where the best collaborations are. Um, any kind of inner, inner country generation transmission that we can use is awesome because then even whenever our renewables are going, we can send it to you, vice versa. Uh, there's some infrastructure um, there that can be done. But then um, I think research is probably going to be the, the strongest like uh, piece of this. Um, sharing lessons, like whenever we can look to Ontario and see what they did right and what they did wrong. Um, I think that kind of just open dialogue and, and conversation, um, especially among um, both elected officials and also just among like, universities, researchers, and things like that. Great. So when we think about the, that NALS commitment and sort of more broadly the themes around coal that we've talked about, I wonder if you can um, give us your insight around the export development opportunities here. As, you know, Canada, we're uh, an economy that in, in large ways is focused on exports. And so do you, do you think that clean energy and clean electricity could be part of that story for Canada? What are the opportunities that you see there around exports? Right, and I think if, um, if the U.S. Um, is, is going to allow compliance with like some of our, our climate goals by taking power from Canada, that's, that's obviously one opportunity. But I think that's kind of um, just one, really, I mean, like, uh, the, the, whoever figures out some of these new grid technologies, new renewable technologies, those are going to be the companies that are going to profit off of those, and I think that that's going to be a big deal. Uh -huh. When someone figures out carbon capture and how to do it cheaply, um, people, like, well, people around the world are going to want it. Um, whatever, you know, like, any kind of thing that, that can make that um, or either, sorry, more palatable, um, is going to be a very popular technology in that when you look at things like um, uh, energy storage, you know, to, to run some of these renewable things, smart grids, things like that that we don't want quite have figured out yet, um, technology first is going to really benefit from it. Um, thanks, Taylor, for your insights. 
I wonder if folks just identify yourself. We'd love to take a couple questions from folks in the room. That's one of the, the other selling uh, features for switching to natural gas. Thanks. Right, and, and um, I think, thank you for the question. Uh, I think China and India is kind of the ones we mostly look at when we're talking about new coal generation. Um, and how much for the, 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 air, or the air quality concerns are going to be addressed is um, going to be variable from project to project. But um, will, they, will uh, coal plants that are first being built in these countries be as clean as what you see in the United States? Likely, maybe not. Um, there's obviously some issues um, with uh, natural gas and its own kind of methane leaks that we heard about earlier. But um, no, I think that if we are going to address those air pollution concerns, um, that does involve um, you know using technology with coal. I think we're going to figure out to make sure that if we are going to have coal-fired power plants built, that they are installed with the kind of the newest controls. I mean, if we have the ability here, or sorry, well, in the U.S. and, and here as well, to, to scrub mercury out of, out of a coal plant um, stack. Question to ask, and um, but that also comes down to how much are, are people going to education versus the you know, that air quality concern. And I think what we're seeing a lot now is um, there wasn't that air quality concern really, and especially we built there is that concern now because they're actually experiencing them, and, and, and I think that's partially why we're seeing a lot of that slow down. Great. I think we have a we have time for probably two more questions. So So how do we go from a situation where you know, we don't end up with wholesale utility collapse and market collapse or price spikes and these things? How do we bring a declining industry and the future, which which looks different, but we have to get there? So what's happening in the US? Are those bankrupt companies being subsidized to continue to operate in the interim, or it's something else? Those companies um, continue to operate. What happened, um, again, this is largely debt-driven. Um, it was not really a function of, of lower coal prices. I think a lot of these companies would have survived um, and been able to um, produce at a lower level and even match just a few years ago down to just under 30%. Um, all those companies could have survived that. They could have shut down mines and then slowly. The problem really there was that they have so much debt that they couldn't afford to bring the production down anymore. Um, so that's kind of a unique case there. Anybody that kind of jumped on the metallurgical coal bandwagon is going to face that problem. Um, but those companies are still producing. Um, important to note, um, at least with U.S. bankruptcy law, um, when a coal mine goes bankrupt, it doesn't have to shut down. Um, the industry themselves are calling them zombie mines because they basically refuse to die. And it's exacerbating the problem with everybody um, in the industry, Murray Energy. Um, they call it the bankruptcy sewer, um, is one of the, the phrases that they use. Basically, um, prices are too low because there's too big of a supply. Coal companies go bankrupt. They continue to produce coal. Coal prices get even lower. See a way out of right now. I'm not sure that anybody's really figured it out. There's a handful of companies that, that might be. They try to jump into metallurgical coal, and um, the U.S. is really kind of a um, so it was a very risky bet to begin with. But um, I think from West Virginia, a lot of places that mine and, and coal that really don't have much else, at least include maybe a conversation about what goes in there. Um, they're kind of a question. Great. And on that, I know. Certainly, um, the government of Alberta is taking steps to. We've also heard opportunities to talk about solutions as it relates to working people. Question, and then I'll wrap up. Mr. Lutzer. Okay. Yeah, we'll fill the room. Okay. Forms of employment and how you might build those kind of bridges for them. 
Do you have any anything else you could add around what would be some of the key elements in transition? Right, and unfortunately, not a lot to add to that. Um, it's something that I've been writing about and trying to figure out for a while, um, and, and we come across a lot. It's, it's a question that's plaguing a lot of people. Um, one of the challenges, and it's, it's different everywhere you go, Wyoming probably won't have quite the challenges because it's, while it's remote, um, it's relatively developable land. Developable land. Um, you go to West Virginia, and again, one from you, you're talking about you know, steep valleys on both sides, there's a stream in the middle, and there might be a, um, a small flat patch of land you might you could probably throw a football across. Um, those town, that was an okay geography for mining. It wasn't, it's not really for anything else. And um, they're too far away really to export anything or to, or to any kind of transport. Um, so figuring out what that means, whether that means working remotely, like, you know, through the internet or, or other kind of jobs. Um, again, complex question and a great question that I think, um, you know, deserves a lot of stuff. I don't think anybody's so, uh, but that is, I'll be around, feel free to quit me. Great, thank you so much. I have one just trying to kind of understand the process of and other other uh, from other speakers, you know the amount of electricity generated worldwide from coal is declining. There's a 50% chance that a new power plant is renewable versus fossil or nuclear. Um, and so I wonder, pulling from that data and these international trends, there are challenges, of course, from uh, just transition. What lessons learned would you, would you bring to Alberta? Would you leave Alberta and Canada with as it sort of seeks to advance a national phase? Look to all jurisdictions again because it's going to be so different. Um, find where people have done it before, and even if it's a smaller scale community, because it, it might even look different, um, you know, anywhere you go within the, the region. But um, I think mainly um, the lessons that it's going to change every time. Um, so what was expensive last year might not be expensive in two years, um, and those kind of things. Um, and keep that in mind. Again, one of the things that we heard in the U.S. was that we couldn't go from 50 percent to 40 and 30 percent coal without you know, huge price increases. And again, they didn't have maybe natural gas will enable that somewhere else. And again, hydro can enable that. Maybe um, you know, great storage will make that easier for, for renewables to come online. But I think the main thing is that everybody has to customize a, a phase out of coal if that's the route they go. And again, would say that like, there is a room in the conversation for coal in some jurisdictions like China and India where in carbon capture needs to be a part of the conversation as well. Great. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us today.